And that was in 1975, I came into the temple. 
but the, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had invited my husband and I to an audience with him before I became captain. So, uh, because he was the first African American president of the International Longshoremen and Warehousemen's Union in San Francisco at Local 10. And as a result, he was a man to be recognized all of his years. He was elected president four times. My husband and I have traveled the, every continent of the world mm. and many countries within each continent. So we've had, I've been to Africa five times. Mm. Wow. And I think the last continent we visited was Australia. But we've been to every continent. But I will say, Islam was very, very important to me, my daughter, and her two children. So I am very grateful, but I will say even today, at 93 years old, yes. I am still consulted for advice. My doctor at Kaiser Hospital just came yesterday because they're expecting a child. And she asked me if I would be the counselor. That's your man. Man. That's and I meet sisters and brothers, wow. like these beautiful sisters that knew me, yes. all three of these, yes. knew me and my work at the temple. Yes, uh, I have many, many things that we introduced to the nation of Islam. I think Jackie has uh, many notebooks of the places I took people or took the sisters and, and introduced them and I have brothers that even tell me they thank me for the things that I taught their wives because I taught home, home economics. I taught them many, many things and most certainly I taught them how to be good wives. So my husband and I were married 50 years and had a very, very successful life and I still am very grateful for the nation of Islam. Introduce yourself again. Sadie, Sister Sadie 5X, Sister Captain, the last captain at 26. Temple 26 wow. in 1976. Okay. And you and you mentioned your husband now. How long were you guys married? 50 years. Yep, your husband, uh, what was his name? Cleophus Williams. Okay, he's no longer with us, right? Yeah, he was never a Muslim, but yeah. he supported the right. Temple. Right because he supported whatever I was involved in. And uh, uh, I remember one of the things I just wanted to add to that, I remember going to Sadie's house and meeting her husband, and I, I, one thing that stuck to my mind that he told me one time, he said, uh, you know, he said, you make sure you take time to prepare yourself before you go out. Even if you have to be late, he said, you know, better because, you know, when you don't go out and you're not clean and not prepared, you just yeah, said know it's, it's, it's better to be late and then to go. Yeah. And then to go, not prepare. <laughs> and I, I stuck to that. I remember <laughs> that. And I stick to that. A year ago, June 24th. What's that? I said he just passed a year ago. A year ago. June 24th. Okay. And you One got of the things that I wanted matter. to add was okay. that she talked about uh, the dad, Cleophas. He was one of the spearheads to the friends of the University of Islam. I don't know if you guys remember that. So a lot of inf uh, people that they knew contribute to a lot of the uh, uh, supplies and stuff of the school and was the friends of the university. Right, to help keep us going. Yep. Well, you look well, Sister Sadie. I'm yes. so happy to see you here yes. with us, you know, our, our former Praise captain, Sister Captain. Okay, we have one more person. A round of applause for Sister Sadie yeah. in her country. We love you, Sister Sadie. Yeah. And I invite any of you to come and visit me. Um, I'll be happy to share my address, phone number. And when you come, come and have lunch with me. So be there at 12 noon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know how that is. Mr. Say, you, if I come, you're going to give me some uh, a bean soup? I ain't had beans no. for long. I don't know. I don't know. I know somebody does. Yeah, yeah. Will make, he should you make you some beans, too. He should be bringing you some. Because I live in a senior home. Yeah, we're okay. good. Okay. How do you tell me? Okay. All right.
You will now, sit and be served. <laughs> yes. I got her business card and I will be there. Okay. Next Monday. Okay. Uh, have oh, my uh, address. Yes. And she's I coming Monday. Monday. Not this Monday, but next Follow. Monday. Yes. yes. And you, brother? Yes, I, I, no, I'm, I'm going to be there. I That's have to decide what day and what time, but... So he coming, he coming. Work now, on now the thing so is, is that yeah. she's saying this, but she really means it for oh, more people oh, to come oh, yes. and oh, yes. visit her. Okay, last but not least, the other one, we got one more person. One more person. Last but not least. Assalamu alaikum. We're here at the second uh, University of Islam reunion, and we got some of our pioneers here, and uh, we want to make sure we get an interview with them and let them speak and say what they have to say and introduce yourselves. So we're going to start with Sister Sadie. Just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. I think this should be a very short interview because Brother Khalid did such a wonderful interview the first time. So I really don't, I could add to it, but I'm not going to. I, I would like for this to be a very short interview because the first one was so wonderful. You did a great job. So I just want to say I was the last captain at the mosque, September 26 in San Francisco. And I'm just proud of all of the beautiful sisters and brothers that I know and stood around. I want you to know I love you all. And that's about all I need to say. Thank you, Brother Khalid. Okay, I'm here at uh, Sister Sadie's house. I'm so happy to see her again. It's been a long time. We've been knowing each other for a long time. And we just want to get a, a little history because she has such a rich history. And uh, we want to just, you know, for, for people maybe that watch this later on to learn a little bit about you. I know we, we had you... Uh, at an event, and we didn't ever did get a real good interview with you. So I'm here at her home. She invited me to uh, lunch, and I had a beautiful lunch where she stays. And now we up in the apartment, and uh, we're going to get an interview. Uh, I'm I'm Khalid Wajid, also known as Larry Crosby, and uh, I'm doing the filming. So Sadie. Just say who you are, Sadie. What's your whole full name? Okay, I'm Sadie. Carter Williams. Okay. Now, first question I want to ask you. Uh, where were you born? I was born in Houston, Texas. I lived at 3030 McGowan Street all of my growing up years. Never moved a day. My mother and father owned our home before my sister, who's old, two years older, before we were born. So we lived at 3030 McGowan. When I was a little girl, I called it Dirty Dirty McGowan because I couldn't say 30, 30. <laughs> so from there, we moved to San Francisco because I had graduated from Hughes Business College when I came to San Francisco. And I've been in the Bay Area ever since. Okay. So now, what was your parents' name? Do you remember? The, my mother. Uh, do I? My, <laughs> my mother was Katie uh, Lucas Carter. Mm -hmm. My father was Logan Fields Carter. And my mother was 30 years old before she had her first child. Wow. That's why they were homeowners, because she was quite old as far as I'm concerned <laughs> at 30 years old. And then two years later, mm -hmm. I was born. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you had any brothers and sisters? Only one sister. Her name was Louise Catherine Carter. Was she older than you? Two or? years and ten days older. Okay. Is, so is she here now? Or is she? I wish I could say my sister was alive. No, she's been dead now about 19 years. Okay. And uh, now your father and mother, okay, now you said you 
you lived in where? Where were you born in? I was born in Houston, Texas. Houston, Texas. My father owned, I, in fact, I first say first, I'm 93 years old, mm -hmm. and I have been supported on the waterfront all of my 93 years, because two years before I was born, my father was on it was at Houston Ship Channel, which is still the Longshore. He owned the restaurant where all the longshoremen had to eat. They because the water was too far from in town for them to go away from the job for lunch. So white and blacks ate in my father's restaurant. They signed vouchers if they didn't want to hold on to their money for the week to feed themselves. And the vouchers were sent up to the office of Anderson Clayton Ship Town and the money was taken out of the longshoremen's checks before they got their checks. So every week my father was issued a large check from uh, Anderson Clayton which they had deducted from the various men's checks before they got them. So. Well, that's quite unique. You say it now. Your father was quite an entrepreneur, right? Absolutely. And, and this was, now this was back in Texas? You 19, said? this was in 1922. Wow. Because I was born in 1924. And mm -hmm. as I said, my father owned that restaurant two years before I was born. Then, when I graduated and married, I insisted that my husband become a longshoreman because I, my father had supported me all my life on the waterfront. So my first husband was a longshoreman and my second husband was a longshoreman. Interesting enough, my second husband spoke at my first husband's funeral. And as he spoke, I was so elated over his eloquence mm -hmm. until when we were getting ready to drive off to go to the cemetery to bury my first husband, I asked the driver to stop and get that man's address <laughs> and name so I could let him know how much I appreciated the words he had said at my first husband's funeral. So that's how I met my second husband who also was a longshoreman. Oh, okay now before we go there, I, will, I want to get on your husband too, but I want to go back a little bit. Uh, now, you mentioned about your father being an entrepreneur, had his own business uh, and now, what about your mother? What was she doing believe during that time? Believe it or not, huh? my father did not believe in women working. Okay, so, so my he mother took was, care. My mother was a homemaker. Okay, great, great. Well, that's quite quite a story to know that you had a father that was a provider, and uh, you know took care of his his woman, took care of his wife. Now, well, we're moving on. Now, you you mentioned about you meeting your your first your first husband. You said you met. Can you go back over that again now? Yes, my first husband was really from Hempstead, Texas, the little city outside of Purview University, where my mother was born. So uh, my mother would send my sister, the two of us, to Hempstead every summer. We'd go to summer camp in Galveston. Then we'd go to Hempstead, Texas. Then we'd go to what they called Eagle Lake, which was my father's family. So... I guess I had courted that young man from Hempstead, Texas before we married. Well, how do you remember how old you were about that time? I would say I was 18 when I started mm -hmm. courting, and of course we married, and my first child was born when I was 20. Okay, so you have a child by, by your first husband. My, I have two children, a son and a daughter. Okay. Oh, okay. And so now, so that was, okay, now how many years did you say marriage with your first husband? Uh, I would say probably 16 years. 16 years, wow. Yes. Okay, and, and uh, what was your first husband's name? His name was John Dawson Jones. Okay. And so now, it's interesting, now you said you had your first husband and you met your second husband through your first husband? <laughs> I would say yes because my first husband spoke at my my second husband spoke at my first husband's funeral. Funeral, okay. Yes. But you you didn't know him then. Oh no, I had never heard the name Cleophas Williams. Okay, so why did he sp speak? Uh, why was he a speaker at your first husband's? Because funeral? he was an eloquent speaker for the longshoremen in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. 
which later he became, well, we can talk about him when you ask the question. Okay. So, okay, so, so that means, okay, so your first husband, he was a longshoreman. That's right. Okay. And so now, after you heard this man speak, now how did the connection come between... Well, uh, uh, I'd say about a year later. Uh-huh. Because by, by me buying a gift and sending it to him, my return address was on the gift. This is nothing I planned, believe uh -huh. me. Uh -huh. So then he came to the address mm -hmm. claiming he was looking for Jetty's children, which means now that Jackie was her second year at Purview, Dan was his, his, uh, his senior year in high school, mm -hmm. so there were no children that he was coming to look for. <laughs> okay, that, that was just his way of coming to meet you. <laughs> That's right. Okay. right. He was really yeah. looking for the widow. <laughs> okay, so you want to share that now? Eventually, you guys got married, right? Oh, so yes, you want to? I'd say about two years later. He two and years I later, married, and, and what year was that? Oh, how old were oh, you? Oh, this was in were? San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was, I was, must have been forty. Forty, okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So now, um, I wanted to know, you know, how long had you married? How long were you married to your second husband? Fifty years. Fifty. Years. Would have been August. He died in June. What year? Uh, but uh, 1916, he died last year. And not too, okay. And we would have been married 50 years that August, June, July, August. So we oh. had a long, beautiful life together. And by the way, this is right now, we, this is uh, December the 28th, uh, 2017, that I'm, I'm having this interview uh, with uh, Sister Sadie. Now, you know... Uh, you know, one thing about, I want to mention, you know, I met your husband oh, some years ago, and I always, you know, was inspired by him. He gave me a lot of good wisdom. He very, you know, always stayed clean, and he told me something that I, that I always remember. He said, you know, always take time to, to prepare, prepare yourself before you go out. He said, if you be late. And I always stuck to that, and I still stick to that, you know. So that was something I, I admired about him. But one thing I wanted to know, okay, now, when you met your husband, now I know you be, later joined the Nation of Islam. Now, when you first met him, you wasn't in the nation, right? No, what were you? I was not. I was born and raised an Episcopalian. Okay. And, and uh, it was the Episcopal summer camps that we would go to, my sister and I would sit to every year. Okay. But anyway... When I met him, he was United Methodist. Methodist. And of course, we had a beautiful life together. But me being so independent and having the kind of father that I had, once he really disturbed me, so I left. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know I that. left him. <laughs> and in doing so, uh -huh. I went to the mosque because I had heard, I had never been in the mosque, I had heard that they take care of the women. Mm -hmm. So when I never forget, when I walked up those steps, the brother said, yes. <laughs> and I said, I have no place to go. Meantime, I was attempting to leave my husband, mm -hmm. Cleophas. Mm -hmm. So he put me with a wonderful sister, Sister Ida Bell. I don't remember Ida, Ida Bell's Bell's last name now. Uh -huh. Sister X, Ida whatever, Bell. Ida Bell and her two beautiful children. And my first night in Sister Ida Bell's home, I fell in love the way her young son could pray. He was the youngest, he had a sister that was older, but he was the man that prayed for us. I'll never forget that night. So I became interested in Islam by being put in Sister Ida Bell's home. Okay, so now, I didn't stay away from Cleophas long because... Mm -hmm. but, but before you go there, I, I do want to know. Now, when you came to the nation, you remember what year that was? Ugh. And, and where the location? You oh, was it was Africa? on Geary. It was at Geary and no. Fillmore. Okay, Geary, okay. That's where the mosque was. Okay, so now, after you... Now, it's interesting because you came in a little later. I, I think I... Didn't I used to bring you the paper? When I used to bring you paper... You probably did because yeah, You I wasn't always, a Muslim then, right? Yeah, yes. And so after you came in, it's quite interesting. Tell us a little bit about after you joined the Nation of Islam. I, I'm going to get back to your husband, though, but I want to know, 
when you joined the Nation of Islam, what happened and, you know, share some of that. Well, I don't know really how it came about, but I was not in the Nation of Islam long before I was named Captain, Sister Captain. Sister Captain. And as in doing so, of course, I had had a lot of experience in business because I came from a business background, my family. Mm -hmm. I opened a little store in the mosque where I sold, uh, sold um, school supplies oh, in one that. of the rooms. Okay. Then after that, I opened a consignment store across the street oh. from, this, from the mosque. Oh, is that right? It was, okay. called, uh -huh, it was called Eureka. And I employed, well, anyway, I was very, very active as a captain. So now the store across the street, I don't even remember that, but now what was that? What was it? It was you called Eureka. What was you selling? Uh, everything, all kinds of clothes. I have lots of pictures of that store across the street and the sisters working in the store. And we sold food. We sold vegetables. I, I do have pictures that I can share with you, Brother Larry. Okay. So now, when you became a uh, sister captain in the nation, now let's go back to, you know, now you said you it was tempting to leave uh, Cleopas. Now, after you joined the nation, now what happened? How did you get back together and, and, and share that experience, uh, how that I relationship? I tell you what happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, I own property and still do in uh, Brookfield Village, which mm -hmm. is off of 98th Avenue mm -hmm. in Oakland, near the airport. And he knew that my daughter and her family was living in my house at that time. And he knew eventually I was going to come see my daughter. So he used to park <laughs> close to... <laughs> it's amazing. It's really funny. Uh -huh. He was constantly parked. Uh -huh. Waiting for me to come visit my daughter. <laughs> so wow. the minute he saw my car, he jumped out of his car, wow. got in front of my car and flagged me down. I'll never forget it. And came to the car and said, I'm not prepared to live without you. Oh, he was determined. Huh? <laughs> he was in tears. Uh -huh. And what I said to him, I will not come back home unless you go to the mosque and meet the brother Mm -hmm. who was the, uh, the imam at that time. The minister, yeah. Uh, the minister mm -hmm. imam. And his, he was, uh, gosh, getting to be old, you can't remember. But he was fantastic. I never shall forget what he told Cleofus. And of course, what I said to Cleofus, you'll have to go to the mosque and let the minister talk to you. Mm -hmm. He was happy to do that, although he was never a Muslim. Mm -hmm. And when he did, I'll never forget Ah, minister. Was it, it was it, a, uh, was it uh, Henry? No, no, it was uh, John Muhammad? No, oh no. It wasn't John. John Muhammad? No, no, no. Who was ahead of him? Uh, okay. Oh, uh, Henry Majid? Majid. Yeah, Henry Majid. Henry. Okay, uh, yes. he met Henry Majid. Majid. Yeah, he was real, he was real he good. He told Cleophas. Mm -hmm. He said, now let me tell you, she may be your wife, but she's our sister. Wow. And we will protect her. And I'll never forget him saying that to Cleophas. And I think it really made a difference in Cleophas' mindset. <laughs> well, you know, this is interesting. And I think a lot of people need to hear that. Now, you were dedicated as a Muslim. And your husband was still dedicated as a Christian, that's right? That's right. That's and, and, but you lived together in peace, love for 50 years. Yep. Now, that shows... Some people say that you can't, a Muslim can't, you know, Christians, and you know, but how can you share maybe uh, to the audience or somebody that might be listening that well, what, you, what, was, what was the recipe that you used that kept you in peace, that kept you, you know, that didn't have no conflict, even though you had a belief uh, yeah, as a Muslim and she, he had a belief as a Christian and yet you was able to live in peace. And we did. What was, what was the recipe well, and secret that you used? because we respect one another. Mm -hmm. And whatever my belief was, he respected that. And what his belief was, I respected that. So, and he never visited the mosque as far as the service was concerned. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we made it. And but eventually, I did go back as a Christian. But mm -hmm. I, we lived very happily together with me being the captain of mm -hmm. the mosque mm -hmm. and being a Muslim uh, 
woman, mm -hmm. and it, it just didn't interfere with us because okay. he respected my belief and I respected his belief. Okay. So I think that was the that's, key. That's great. So that shows that you can live together with a person that believes in a different religion and have not have the wars and conflicts. Oh, we people, never had conflicts yeah. about that. Because now, now, going back on the, your, your time as a captain, now you were actually the last captain that they had under the old nation of Islam before Imam War Jim came, that right? That is correct. I was the last captain before so they uh, reverted Mayfair. over to not needing captains. Yeah brothers or sisters. Yeah, that, that transition before that the transition. transition made. Well, you know what? That is such a great history now. Uh, now, we just visited you, uh, you know, I'm, uh, now you said, how old How old are you now? I'm 93, February 25th, I will be 94. See, now, I cannot believe you're so active for to be that age. I mean, you know, somebody looking at you, they just can't tell. Now, we just we just had, uh, I just had a chance to see you working out in the workroom. You said how often you work out on the, on well, the, on actually, the machines there again? Actually, at 93, I am grateful to Almighty God Allah. Mm -hmm. I have no aches, no pains, no arthritis, or no, I'm most grateful for my mental ability. I have no dementia, no Alzheimer's, and I have five generations of children. So, but at 93, I know I'm truly, truly blessed and I'm grateful, but I know that I had to help a lot. Mm -hmm. And by doing so, I exercise every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I do 30 pounds of strength training mm -hmm. on the machine. Mm -hmm. I lift 30 pounds for 24 reps. I do six and rest, not rest, just break for a minute and then I do six four times mm -hmm. at 30 pounds each. Mm -hmm. Then after I get off of that machine I ride the stationary bike wow. for, thir for three miles without stopping. Wow. Now that I don't stop. I pump and pump and pump until mm -hmm. I get three miles and, and uh, I feel wonderful. Some days I will admit I don't feel like doing that mm -hmm. And I'll get, sit on the machine and I'll say, I don't feel like doing you, but I know I have H-A-V-E to do you. And then I start, start my 30 Which pounds. Which means H-A-V-E. And I do it without fail. I cannot afford not to do that. Mm -hmm. So it's one of the things I know I must do in order to stay strong. I'm strong, but I am old. <laughs> <laughs> so... I want to know, I mean, and, and share some of the other uh, things that you do. I mean, do you have other activities that you oh, participate in? Oh, I'm very in? active. I'm very active in mm -hmm. all the activities here. Mm -hmm. And I'm blessed to live at a place that has activities almost every minute, every hour on the hour. Mm -hmm. So it keeps my brains going. I do uh, drawings. I draw and we exhibit our drawing. I've made a quilt since I've been here. And then every Wednesday they take us to the UC Berkeley to the free noon concert and they just keep us very active. They take us on what they call joy rides. Mm -hmm. We don't get off the van. They just take us various places, even to San Francisco. So I live a very, very active life. And then we play games that keeps the brain active, like you be the judge. They read cases, actual cases. And then we have to judge the outcome, and then they'll tell, read us what the outcome was. But this place keeps us very active mentally, mm -hmm. physically, I'd even say spiritually, because they do have a chaplain here mm -hmm. who's really very, very good. Well, okay, now, you, uh, you seem to be very healthy. You know, I mean, now, have you always been healthy like this? Or? Uh, yes, I really okay. have. So, I mean, what's the difference? I mean, what have you been doing that's kept you looking like you're doing and, and, and keeping you healthy? And I mean, feeling. I mean, yeah, have you, it, 
Can you share that? I mean, did you experience like you know, most young people had drugs and alcohol and cigarettes? Oh, so I never smoked. You and never, I never smoked. Drank. And I never drank. I never drank. My sister did, and she would tell everybody, watch Sadie, because <laughs> she'll drink all our chasers, uh -huh. which is generally 7 Up or Orange oh, Juice okay. or whatever the chasers <laughs> would be. So that's that's got to be a part of the recipe. I have never acquired a taste wow. for wine. All your life. I'm not even I'm not even too happy with champagne. Uh -huh. I might toast somebody yeah. with a glass okay, of champagne. I got you. But alcohol has never been a part of, part, my life. part of your life. And I've never put a cigarette between my lips. Wow. And I worked at the California Hotel and a bellman used to tell me, Sadie, you sure would look good with a cigarette holder <laughs> and smoking. <laughs> he bought me a beautiful ivory uh -huh. cigarette holder. Uh -huh. And I told him, I don't want that. I, and I never did. Wow. I have never been interested. I never thought smoke looked good coming out of a human's nose <laughs> or mouth. Yeah. <laughs> wow. See, that, that's got to be part of the reason why you... But I you tell you what my big secret is. Okay. I think, besides exercising, because mm -hmm. I know that's really one of the things that keep me as well as I am, is love. L-O-V-E. Mm -hmm. Love is the answer. Yes. I love people. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't like everybody's ways. Yes, yes. But I love human beings because I know the image that they're made from. All human beings are made in the image of Allah. Wow, yeah. And I mean, I love. I don't know a living soul I don't love. I do not like some people's ways. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's them. Yeah. That's what makes us individuals. Okay. But I would say keep a happy heart. Keep a loving heart. And be kind. Hmm. Wow, that's 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 great. I mean, so now, <clears throat> do you uh, what do you think that some of the the ills and problems that we that we have now that you didn't have to go through that you to see some of the problems that might um, that might exist today that you feel that wasn't as a problem for you when you were coming up. You think, well, can you think of any? Uh, I, I'm just thinking it's love because my parents taught me love. Mm -hmm. And they never allowed my sister. And I hear people talk about sister rivalry. I don't understand that because my mother and never allowed my sister and I to fight one another or be angry with one another. I mean, if she hits me and I cry, my mother would never ask, who started this? She whipped both of us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So we had to love one another. Mm -hmm. Then love was an, a real example in my home. But and that, that means you didn't always agree with each other, right? Oh, you guys didn't, no. you know, Let but you still love. One little simple thing my sister would do: she could pop chewing gum. <laughs> she loved to chew gum, and she'd pop it. And she'd that, even go to bed with gum in her mouth, <laughs> and she'd pop it. Uh -huh. And I would be so mad at uh -huh. her until a couple of times I hit her. <laughs> <laughs> that was my mistake. I got a whipping. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, no, my yeah. mother and father never allowed us to be fight one another or be angry. I don't understand that sibling rivalry. I don't understand that at yeah. all. Yeah, I think I think a lot of the uh, youngsters. The one thing they have to realize is that we're all different, and you got to be able to be tolerant. We're of each all individuals. The way you think, you might not, not, might not agree with me, I might not agree with you, but that shouldn't make I hate, I, hate you, you know. I think you should respect how the other person feels about whatever it is, because they're in, we're all individuals. Right. I know that's the reason my husband and I could get along with being Christians and Muslims, mm -hmm. because, I mean, if that's what he wanted to be, that's what he was. Mm -hmm. He did not have to embrace Islam just because I did. Right. I didn't have to embrace Christianity because he did. Mm -hmm. So it's all a matter of people of respect, mm -hmm. respecting and loving one another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, uh, I, I just wanted to, uh, people to understand too that uh, a lot of times that we find each other's uh, beliefs. You know, we we have a, a, a issue about that. Now, I. I uh, I don't know if you, is there anything else you want to share on camera? Because uh, you know, I just I'm not. Uh, Only thing I'd like to say, I just love Brother Larry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm behind the camera. <laughs> okay, well, I am so glad 
we got this interview. Uh, I can't think. Uh, Wanda probably has some more questions for you. She's not here. She wasn't able to make it. But I know she probably have a whole lot of other things she'd like to ask you. But I think this is this is not going to be the end. You know, we we got we we got you on camera. We want to do some more research. We got, and I, I this is my first time uh, coming here, and uh, I met quite a few interesting other individuals here at this complex that needs to be their stories need to be told too. So Sadie, now, I, just, I must say this. Okay, I love Sister Wanda because believe it or not. I don't drive anymore. I have not been. I have not driven in two years. Mm -hmm. I gave up driving just because of the traffic and the craziness that's out there yeah. in the streets. Mm -hmm. But anyway, Sister Wanda will see that I get to go to plays or art shows, right. and she just often calls me, to asking Sister Sadie, "Would you like to go here?" And she makes sure that I go to plays, and oh, so she will call me sometime, and I said. Just wonder, I cannot go out at night because I cannot see mm -hmm. where I'm walking. Mm -hmm. Sidewalks are broken or cracks, mm -hmm. and so I just really stay in at night. But she'll take me to matinees and various things, and I just love her for it. Right. So, and I, of course, I love anyone visiting me because mm -hmm. I don't go out now. At 93, I have to, I go where someone takes me. Yeah. Well, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Oh, God, yes. Yeah. Just wanted to see that I get out to plays and yeah. various things. Wow. Well, Sister Sadie, uh, I, I can't think of anything else I want to ask you right now, but I really enjoy being in your company once again. You show so much love. You always have a beautiful smile. You make me feel good. And I know it's love there. You oh, know, yes, when, I, when I meet you, when I see you, you know, you showed me a lot of love, so, and I appreciate that, you know, so, and like I said, uh, your, your husband, uh, Cleothus, you know, I admired him, and I, I had a lot man. of respect. And I must for, say this about mm -hmm. Cleothus, Cleothus and I have traveled to every continent, every continent, and many countries within the continent, and we've been to Africa five times, different parts of Africa. So we've done a lot of traveling, United States all over to every national park. We have really been truly, truly blessed, yes. and I am a grateful person. Well, you know, that says a lot because how many husbands uh, or, you know, uh, families, husband and wife, were able, even able to travel like you did? That means that's saying a lot about your husband, that's saying a lot about you, but, uh, you know, I think... You know, some of the experience that you learned, can you, uh, is the benefits, what are the, some of the benefits you feel that from traveling that you can share that you think, can you think of anything that you can share with people from your travels? Another thing I'll say about that, love again. You go and you meet all of the different kind of people. I remember the last place we, the last continent we went to was Australia. Mm. And, and of course we went from Australia to New Zealand. But the people, Cliffs and I meet people as if we have known you, and it's because we love, we love human beings. Mm -hmm. All human beings are created equal. There's no one person better than another. Mm -hmm. Of course, this was one of the things my mother taught me and my sister. We were no better than anyone, and no one, I mean no one, are better than you. Mm -hmm. And she used the example, Queen Elizabeth is no better than you. She's just in a better position. Mm -hmm. But all human beings are created equal. And that I truly understand. So I have no problems with people. Mm -hmm. I know no one's better than me. And I also know so I'm you go with no that, better than anyone else. So you go with that frame of mind when you travel around, whether they're Caucasians or what other, you know, or uh, Asians, you don't Clearly see yourself as inferior or nothing when like that. When we were in Singapore... You was in Singapore For too? some reason, when I got in the hotel, I threw away my papers to get me back to the USA. Mm. And at a banquet, at this particular banquet, uh, they had a Singaporean at every table. And the couple, in fact, couple, the couple that sat at the table where we were, because as I meet all people, all people, as if I've known them before, I still hear from my couple from Singapore. Wow. In, 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 
Wow. Uh, and in Africa, believe it or not, I'm one of these that say, come and see me. If you ever come to the United States, come and see me. Same as I'll invite anybody that want to come visit me, please do that. I'd love to have you, whomever you are. This family. Now, you remember what part of Africa? Uh, I was in Kenya. Okay. We were in Kenya. Mm -hmm. And I said this to a family. And they had a daughter, because now believe it or not, Africans believe in education. Mm -hmm. Their children are well, they don't fool around like our American children. Mm. Believe me, I can tell you a lot about that. So all of their children were being educated, even though it's hard on them and they don't have. But anyway, this one girl wanted to be a beautician. This family would not allow her to be a beautician. They didn't. Cleofs and I were back home, me saying, come see us, come see us. We were home two weeks, and that family sent their daughter, Rosemary, to stay with us. Mm. So we were able to get her into college. Mm. She got her master's degree. Wow. Her brother came and he married an American girl, so mm -hmm. he didn't have to go back. Her mother came and got her master's degree, all because of our visit. When wow. me, me and my big mouth, come see us. <laughs> <laughs> that's beautiful, though. I mean, that's really, uh, see, that's how God has blessed you. Now, in, in, when they were in Kenya, what uh, were they in? Uh, in a rural area? Or Let good, me tell you. Know, they, I, and how many children her, did they have? Her, they had four children. And they was, but her husband was a colonel. You know, I don't know much about service. He was a colonel in the service. Mm -hmm. So they were really... Let me tell you this. Africans do not live in the jungles. Mm -hmm. Africans have beautiful homes. Mm -hmm. it, is Amer it is America that only show Americans that Africans are... Yeah, I don't know what up. they want to call them, but believe me, that's not. Africans are highly intelligent. Mm -hmm. They have beautiful homes. They're different than our homes. But and the Africans have, I say, servants because they bring people from the bush to live in their home, and of course they work for them. But they're not slaves. But they help. They help one mm -hmm. another. We are the most beautiful people on the planet. And I would even say the most intelligent people. And you say we, what do you mean? I'm about? talking about Africans. Oh, Africans. Okay. I'll say Africans. Okay. And we all are, are inheritance, are all from Africa, one way or the other. Wow. But we can be a proud race. If the Americans allowed uh, the American people to see the mindsets and the way Africans, they can make absolutely anything and everything and make them well. It is, you would be proud of yourself and the things that I see our youngsters doing, they would not do it because they'd be too proud because we are a proud people. So I think a part of the uh, problems too is not being exposed to our people in those countries and a lot of our children need to see that. I, I, I had a one video of a brother that went to uh, Timbuktu. And they had a classroom situation. But these children they hardly had no clothes. They had to write on boards. But they was learning education. And they, and they, didn't, they didn't feel look like they were frustrated or nothing. No. They, they didn't even have the papers they or pens books. and stuff. They share paper. They share pencils. Because uh, for some reason... Money is not available to Africans. I yeah. don't know why it is yeah. so, well, they're so deprived. Mm -hmm. But they make the best of what they have and they use it to their best advantage. Mm -hmm. Highly intelligent people. And their children do not fool around with their education. They make sure they learn everything that's available for them. You'd be some proud of yourself if you really knew about Africans. Cruise and they have a good house. spirit too, don't they? Oh I mean, my God. they don't have that, you know, like you see a lot of uh, people, our children out here and, and Afro Americans in America, we get frustrated because we don't have a, this. Uh, and you don't need all of like that. that. Yeah. You really don't need all of that. Mm -hmm. Make good use of what you have mm -hmm. and use what you have. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. I tell you, I used to ask Cleophas, honey, please put me some money in Africa so I go back and forth because he never did that. <laughs> <laughs> I am so proud of Africans. Wow. 
Well, that's something we need to see that. I think more people need to. Don't worry, be able to United visit. States of America makes sure we as a people do not know from whence we came. Mm -hmm. That's keep part that, of the United knowledge. States brainwash. Yeah, yeah, that's something that we need to uh, find a way to communicate and, and touch bases with our family. Absolutely, absolutely. So, you would be a different person. These kids that waste their time and fooling around with junk, oh, I just it just breaks my heart. And running down with the pants all down. Yeah. You're never going <laughs> to see an African child or mm. a young man with his pants yeah. below his yeah. waist. Don't do that. Mm. I mean, wow. So, I mean, it's important that you carry yourself every day. What did Cleophas tell you about preparing yourself yes. before you go out? Yeah. You don't go out just looking any kind of way. Yes, I remember. And most certainly, what adult needs to see me. your underwear? <laughs> Just yeah. name it. Tell I me what understand. adults need to know what kind of underwear you have on. Yeah. Nobody. Yeah. We don't need to know what one another is wearing underneath our mm -hmm. clothes. And it, it's kind of crazy to me because when they wear their pants, it's almost like they're falling off. And how do you get around? I mean, if you have to run somewhere, you have to, oh, you so have to move it's real a, fast. Your pants, is, and I don't even know how they stay up on them. It's so I don't sad, understand the youngsters doing mentality that. You know? Because it's not necessary to show as I say, show your underwear. Yeah. It's not necessary. Yeah, and that's not even manhood either. No, 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 no one needs to know what uh, you're wearing. Yeah. So, can you remember any other countries in Africa offhand? I know you've been to a lot of them. Can you offhand? Can you well, remember? Well, and I went for the opening of the University of Africa in Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe. Wow. I can. Education is very important to those children even though they don't have the supplies or the material they need. But education is top priority. Well, how did you know, how did you find out about the, the grand well, opening? Well, I tell you, one of the things we followed, uh, the World Methodist Conference, Cliffs and I went whenever the World Method, and they only meet every four years. Before. And he and I went to the World Methodist Conference every four years in different parts of the, the country, world, even in England. Oh yeah, and you name it. So mm. we always went with the group, and then of course there's the International Longshoreman, which Cleophas was. We went to International Longshoreman. We didn't travel long, just the two of us, and we went to Egypt wow. with the uh, with the. Uh, oh my God! Too bad I can't name it, but we went with Jesse Jackson and wow. his whole family. Wow. We always joined groups that was going, intelligent groups. I wish you had some pictures of that. That would be oh, I have I have you pictures of those. Now I'll tell you something. My husband took notes. He wrote in a journal every day wherever we were. I have notebooks of every place we traveled. Mm -hmm. He wrote and I took pictures. I have eons. Mm -hmm. Of pictures from everywhere we travel, well, we, and I love go sharing. Do that one day, and then also I, Wanda need to do something with that journal to help you with that, you know, because she's a writer. She's a terrific writer, man. I mean, I I have to admire her for that. She's very good at yeah. that, and that that be somebody that might want to help help you. Do. So was my husband. He, I I can show you journals of wow. every place we travel, and then so of you, course I have eons of pictures. Very, albums and they were all organized so anybody want to come visit me and <laughs> see some of the places we traveled mm -hmm. and all the friends and just wonderful I'll be happy to so share. Now your husband uh, how long was he a longshoreman? Well he started when he was 20 mm -hmm. I think he was really 19 he put his age up uh -huh. and he became the first black president of local 10 Local, local 10, 10 is what? Local 10 is the longshoremen's in San Francisco at Fisherman's Wharf. Mm -hmm. They own that whole block. Wow. Over on, uh, anyway, it's the Octagon Building. Mm -hmm. If you ever go to Fisherman's Wharf and you mm -hmm. walk a block over, the whole block, there's an Octagon Building, which is the International Longshoremen's Hall. And of course, then they have the offices on the same premises. And you park, and there's parking on the, that lot. There's sometimes if you go into the wharf and need a place to park, I can give you a number to put in your windshield, oh, and you wow. can park for free. 
Wow. So you, your, so your husband was a, the president of the longshoremen? First black, black, black president black. of the International Longshoremen, longshoremen. of San Francisco wow. Local 10. So, and he was elected four times. What? Wow. So now, uh, you say he did a lot of writing in the journals. So he must have had a pretty good education, did he? Or uh, did he just learn this? No, no. He, he, he graduated from uh, uh, in, in Arkansas, Arkansas State. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he was, he was an educated man. Wow. I graduated uh, from Hughes Business College. Oh, you in did? Houston. Uh -huh. Houston? Okay. And all of my children, because I only had two, mm -hmm. my two children are college graduates. Mm -hmm. Their two children, both of my children, had two of college graduates. Wow. And all of my, cause, because this is what we do in our family. Mm -hmm. When you finish high school, the next thing for you to do is go to college. Now, your parents may not be able to, but we all will help send you to college. Mm -hmm. We pool as a family, we pool our resources to make sure that you were able to go to college. Mm -hmm. So all of my children for four generations, not five because the, the fifth generation are still babies, but for four generations are college graduates. So you, you recommend that, that that should be uh, something that all the uh, parents and children should do is get an education. Education you, is you the key it. to a good life. Good life. Education. There's no ifs and ands about it. Mm -hmm. Because you got to almost have an education to be a garbage man nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> You're right up there. Yes. But I would recommend when your children graduate from high school, don't let them go to work because if they start making money, they they're not going to want to stop yeah. making money. So you recommend? I recommend that they know when you graduate from high school, the next thing you're going go to, college. to college. And all the family help support them. Okay. I mean, the grandparents, the aunties, the, anybody in the family is able to contribute $1, mm -hmm. contribute a dollar to that child's education. That's good to hear. I mean, with some consistency, yeah. know that that dollar is coming Every two issues, every one of their two issues. Mm -hmm. mm. It's important that families stick together. But that's a problem. I, I, you know, we have that problem now where family members don't get along it's like they should. It's because it's purposely done to us. Mm -hmm. Divide and conquer. Mm -hmm. No, you don't let nobody divide you from your family. I'll tell you, I have five generations two times. Mm -hmm. That's five generations is a lot. Mm. You know? So, so that's where you, your strength is, right? If you have that family uh, where you can get along and work strength. together, and so, like you said, support each other. Yes. Like you have a, if you have a, a one one child that's in school need financial help, that you can all pull together and help him to finish his education. Your strength comes from your home. That's where you were born and raised. You're not gonna pick up strength out there in the street, not from your friends. Not from your whomever else you think is so important. It comes from your home. So mothers and fathers, take care of your children well, and raise them properly. Now you say that, but now what about you have the, you know, a lot of family members now. You have families where, uh, you know, the, the, the brothers and sisters are in, on drugs or doing things that, you know, that how would you... I would tell how would you, you address that? You know, you, you say you work with family, but how do you work with a family but, member that, that's not even doing nothing, they're not taking care of you, can't even trust them in your house? Well, what, I tell what do you, you one how thing, do you solve that? What, what? The way you solve any problem in your family is by showing love to that particular person that has strayed. Because children will stray. Mm -hmm. You know, they think it's important to follow their friends and, and their friends have not come from a loving home. But you still show your child love, and you get him back. I'd be willing to bet you get him back. I think sometimes it's a limit to that, Bobby, because you can show love to that, that member of the family, and they just don't want to do right. And, well, you know, there, there are things that you let them know you will not tolerate. Okay. I can remember a great-grandson of mine that now that these doggone phones come in, when we're together, nobody is sitting up texting or watching their phone. And I remember one saying to a great grandson, put that thing down. Because to me, you know, I'm saying it thing. Mm -hmm. But it was his cell phone or text. And he got angry and got up and walked out of the door. Mm -hmm. But honey, Cleophas went out and his grandmother 
went out, who was really a daughter of ours, went out and talked, I imagine, an hour to him. And when he came back in, he apologized to me. Oh, wow. <laughs> he got up, walked out, slammed the door. I cried because I was not accustomed to any yeah. of the children doing me that. And you can believe me, from that time on, he right. never came in the house. Because when we're together, we talk. We have conversations. We want to know what's going on with you. And if there's something we can do to help, what is happening with you? We talk. We don't watch television when we're together. We sit in circles. Just this Christmas, there was 24 of us. We had 24 chairs around my granddaughter's house in Walnut Creek. And we talk to one mm. another. You have a problem? Because you have problems in family. Let's talk about it mm. and see if we can't help solve it. You've got to be together as a family. Mm. You cannot be divided. And nobody's more important than your family. Mm. Nobody. You think your friends are important. Your friends have their own family. Mm. So it's mm. very important. <laughs> be a family. If you two got these children together, you two stick with those children. Mm -hmm. Now we have a great granddaughter mm -hmm. that's not married and has the most beautiful, intelligent child you ever want to see. But we made sure that child went to a private school. We all as a family would pay $300 a week for that child to go to a private school. Mm -hmm. we know so you all pitched in? We all, we all pitched in. That's the best thing to mm -hmm. say, Larry pitched in. I mean, how am I going to sit up here and have all the things I need and my grandbabies out there not getting the proper education? So now, when you give this, are you giving out of charity or you give it as a loan to them? Oh, no, no. We're not loaning. We're making sure you get an education. But I must say this. Mm -hmm. I have a grandson that graduated from Purdue and his first paycheck he sent me $600 without me asking for wow. a dime. Is that right? Okay. Uh -huh. On his first paycheck. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then he sent other members who had helped him. That's I don't know how much, but at least. So, so when you do that, it's not that you're looking for a return, but I was sometimes shocked. it comes. I wanted to know, what's this for? <laughs> wow, that's great. And that's he great. said, Grandmother, as much as you've helped me, mm -hmm. I will admit he's the only one that has done that, though. Okay. <laughs> so, so. Uh, and then, like I said, you, when you do it, you're not really looking for that return. You no, got to do it in the spirit of just helping them. I want to make sure that them. they do their best. Mm -hmm. And I tell you one thing: if they know you as a grandmother or a mother, respect them. They're going to respect you. I don't believe there's a child in my family that would ever want me to even see them drinking, let alone smoking something wrong. I don't believe there's a child that would want me to see them. And mm. I'm not going to tell you they don't or they do, because I, I don't know. Not in my presence. It's because they respect me, because they know I love them. In mm -hmm. fact, I would tell them, you will kill me. I will die if you out there doing what I see some of these kids. And I mean that. Mm. It would kill me mm -hmm. to see some of my loved ones, grands, great-grands, great-great-grands, I just know I would not be able to sleep. I would cry. It's amazing. Well, you know, that's a good point you made that uh, they do, uh, they respect they you. They respect you. And, and uh, one of the things I think is important that in order for that child to respect you, you got to be uh, worthy of their, of your, their respect, oh, right? You can't be doing things that they can't, they're going to disrespect you and you can't. You cannot be cursing, drinking, acting crazy, mm -hmm. or any of those things they in not their presence. Mm -hmm. They're not going to have that, that, that uh, uh, initiative to want to respect you anyway. all of my grands and great-grands and great-great-grands and even children would tell you, oh no, grandmother wouldn't do that, or Gigi as they call me. You know, I mean, because they know I'm not going to do various things. You've so, got to carry yourself in a respectful so, way. So if you think if a person is not living up to the, the, the earn respect, they're not going to get that respect How from the child, you? right? Because the kids don't know how to respect you if you have not lived up to earning their respect. Okay. That's a good point. Then you've got to. 
it's 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 a full time job, but it's a responsibility that we have as adults. Mm -hmm. We adults are responsible for what the children do, say, and how they act. Well, I think that's a big problem now because you got so many parents that children can't have they they, they they look up at their, their parents they don't have they can't respect them because they're not doing things to earn that I, respect. I remember one and that's day, a big problem. I remember one day I was sitting on the bus stop bench waiting for my daughter and her daughter to come out of Kaiser Hospital, you know where the children's section is over uh, on on and I just went out and sat on the bench and this mother came with her two children and she cursed those children. Mm, yes, yeah. And then turned around and looked at me sitting on the bench and apologized to me. And she don't know me from Eve. Mm hmm But she cursed her with the children. <laughs> and she said, "Lady, I'm sorry." And she doesn't even know. But what about she? What was she doing to those children? Yes, yes. And they again, don't realize Because I cry very easily. Look I at, sat there with tears yeah. in my eyes. Yeah. And I see that quite often, you know, when I go to the store and stuff. Uh, the, the way, uh, you know, Afro-American mothers talk to their children, call them, I'm going to beat you behind and you use foul language. And I said, wow, what, what is, what is they I doing? And they talk thinking. real loud, too, shouting at them, know uh, you know, thinking. with anger. Instead of talking to them, they cut, you know, they're cussing them out practically, you know. It's horrible, but it's all because they're following the wrong you know, the, the America is a prejudiced thing, oh, yeah. country. Mm -hmm. They intend to break us up and divide us. And we should say, it's just like Michelle Muhammad says, when they go low, we go high. Mm. You don't get down there. Mm -hmm. but, but these folks want us to be nothing mm -hmm. so they can disrespect us and make sure they don't hire us. Mm -hmm. it's, it's horrible. No. So let's get ourselves together and be strong and know we are the kings and the queens of the world. Mm -hmm. We're the queens and kings, mm -hmm. not them. Mm -hmm. We are the queens and kings of the world. And if you don't believe it, you take these Africans out. They come here strong. They come to America because they taught that in Africa. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I wanted to go back on something that you had said when, uh, when uh, well, I think you said you one of your nephews or somebody kind of disrespected you, uh, and, and he went left the house, and, he, and Cleothus went out there, and, and they went out and talked. They talked for a whole hour. I have I'm no just, idea. I'm just curious what they said. I have no idea. <laughs> but, but it's interesting because they took a whole hour to whatever they said to him. They you know that, that 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 child, and they came back and with, apologized. With apologized. So I think. That's a that's a, a important point that sometimes you have to spend time. Whatever I, I'd be good to know what he said, but, but also it must have been something very you know that took a long time. But what it's not something you just can talk I to a person. Think, I don't think that child grasped right away what Cleof was saying, so it took Cleof an hour to hour. explain to it. <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah, that's. Yeah. I, I would like to heard that I would conversation. Like to know too, but I know one yeah. thing: he came back in and he, he apologized. Yeah, he changed. Okay, well. And from that day on to this, mm -hmm. he still respects me yeah. and the family, and he respects himself. Mm -hmm. The main things have respect for yourself. Mm -hmm. And again, wow. I'll say. We are the queens and the kings of the planet. Mm -hmm. Don't forget that. Don't let anybody let you think you're not. Mm -hmm. I think we're the original men <laughs> and women. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Sister Sadie, I, I mean, I have benefited so much from, you know, this interview with you. And I, you know, it's, I know it's a lot more you can tell, tell us. And, uh, you know, I don't have uh, all the questions I need to ask you. But this is a start. And uh, hopefully we can share this, you know, with the world. You know, we, people need to hear this. People need to hear stories that you have because, you know, a lot of the, uh, the young people, especially young people, they are lost and they, they need guidance. Their parents, a lot of them, have came from broken homes, you know, and they don't have that person that, that they can share with them, you know, like you sharing, you know, to keep them. Because our children are good, you know, and I think... If we gave them positive images and positive uh, uh, models, you know, 
they would do better. Do you, you know, know they, how we can't innocent, fault them. We can't fault them. Do you know how innocent every human being is born? Babies, they don't know anything. It's mm -hmm. their only shape. They're like putty in our mm -hmm. hands. Mm -hmm. They're only shaped from their environment. Mm -hmm. So give them a good environment. And you believe me, you will have good human beings. Yeah. Well, we got to get busy. And it's and up to the adults. Yeah, we got to change this environment. Children we... are children. They all are, don't they all come here? Infants. Right. Mm -hmm. Can't even feed themselves. Mm -hmm. Can't do nothing for themselves except with the adults. So do the best for them and with them. I mean, we all, everybody comes here the same way mm -hmm. as babies. Yeah. Take care of the babies. Please take care of the babies. <laughs> well, I think we're going to end with that, uh, Sister Sadie, for today. And I really appreciate you taking time to allow me to, you know, interview you. Uh, once again, I have a lot of love for you, and I respect you so much, and I admire you. And, uh, you know, just to, to hear what you had to say is such a blessing for me to get this on tape. And so... Uh, uh, God willing, you know, that uh, later we'll have maybe another time to meet and and uh, get an interview. So I'm going to end with that, and I'm going to give the greetings. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Peace, peace be upon you, those who uh, don't know what that means. Okay, thank you so much, Sadie. Okay, we here in the in the gymnasium here. Look at this is Sadie. Now tell me, this is thirty pounds every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Twenty four reps. I do six. And stop. You do this how often now? I do Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Wow. And I do 24 reps. And how old are you? 93 years See, old. See, now that's what's keeping you in shape. See, okay. now people need to learn. Then I ride the stationary bike. You do this too? I do three miles. So it has a gauge on it. Let you know. Three miles. Oh, oh my God. God, you're tough. <laughs> See, you is tough. <laughs> You better than me, look here. <laughs> yeah, Three miles. I, I don't believe this. You can't be. Every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Yeah. So, this is this your secret for staying young? Yes. That is the answer. That's the answer. So, people need to learn. They need to know you cannot. You know, they, they need to see this. You cannot stay young without exercise. 96 Same years old. Thing. Okay, we got two sisters in here. Yeah. You want to share anything about you or who you are or anything? Okay, we got Sadie in here with a friend, and she's in the work. This is a work group. And you say you do this how often? Every Monday, every Wednesday, and every Friday, immediately after breakfast. Wow. Even if I don't feel like doing it, I come <laughs> and do it. Wow. You, you're amazing. That, that yeah. is amazing. People are going to love to see this. Yeah. You know, especially people that know you. You know, yes, they, they don't know you, you um, work out like this, you know. But I've always worked out. You have always worked oh, yeah. out. Oh, yeah, and I were very active at the Y. Mm -hmm. and so I've had, I've had trainers. I know what I'm doing. Wow. I'm not at all lost. <laughs> you, 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 you're amazing here, you know. That's, yes. that's amazing no. to see this. But uh, anyway, I don't want to wear you out now. Don't get more out now. Okay. Three miles on this one. So you you have a gauge up there, oh, yeah, 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 and yeah. and you say you do three miles. Every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, three miles without stopping. Oh wow! Okay. That's good. And then I do twenty four reps. Okay, that on this day. Huh? Of thirty pounds of strength training. What's that again now? Called strength training. And you do how much? I do twenty four. Twenty four. Twenty four what? I do six reps. Four times. Okay. And how much is that like a certain weight? Uh, oh, it's 30 pounds. 30 pounds. Every time okay, I Okay, it's like you're doing 30 pounds 
and you do it. Okay, I got you. That's the machine over here. Wow, okay. Okay, I'm here once again to do an interview with my good sister, uh, Sister Sadie, special woman. And uh, we outside right now from uh, the, her residence. And this this going to be the first time I'm getting a chance to interview her outside of where she where she uh, have residence at. Now we at this particular location, we have a, a, a gravestone. Memorial. A memorial for her pat for uh, uh, her uh, former husband, uh, who I say is Cleopas. So you want to just share about this memorial? It's a rock that's in the ground, really nice, and it's got plants around it. So just share a little bit about that. Good. This is a memorial garden that was created for my husband Cleophas Williams, and it has a stone in the middle of seven rose bushes. The roses are mostly yellow because I'm from Texas and it's the yellow rose of Texas. But it's on the premises of the Pacific Senior Home in Oakland and they allowed me to plant a rose garden in memory of my husband Cleophas with a rock that reads in memory in loving memory. In loving memory, Cleophus Williams, 1923 to 2016. Much love from family. Right. That's what the rock says. That's, that's what it's got. It's right here in the, in the yard with nice uh, shrubbery and you know, trees oh, it's here. A beautiful. Yeah, it's so a beautiful be yard. Let's see it's if I can get a little closer to it. Yeah. Anyway, I want to say we gave a memorial celebration for him. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the exact date now. And we had more than a hundred people here to celebrate with us in dedicating this memorial to Cleophas. Okay. So that's how we, and most of them were, in fact, I'd say longshoremen's his Downs, his United Methodist Downs community, and especially the Methodist men, his golf community, because he was quite a golfer. Okay, well. uh, what year, to, what do you know, you remember what year that I was? I have to give Brother Larry those dates. I'm not good at remembering okay. dates. Okay, well don't worry about it. <laughs> But it, it, but he, you said he had about over a hundred people. We had more than a hundred and fifty. And where was it at? It was right out here. There were fifty chairs with a white canopy over them. Okay. Uh, on the garden over there, and there were fifty chairs on each side of the memorial garden, making a hundred and fifty. Oh wow! It was it was beautifully yes, done. Yes, yes, that's with nice. A fantastic yeah. program. I'm just going to pan around here. So, you see, is this the, the garden that they had the memorial at? So, okay. All right. Yeah, I just wanted to share that. So, we're going to get with your interview. And uh, I just want to uh, first, you know, start with, you know, remembering your husband. So, let me... Okay. Uh, <laughs> Sadie, how you doing, my Oh, I'm good. so happy to see you. All right, good. Happy to see you again. So, I'm here... Uh, interviewing Sadie. This is my about the third, fourth interview that I had, and this is going to be the first one that we're doing outside her, of her complex. So this sister is a very special sister, very special woman. You know, she's got a rich history, and I I feel that it's very important for her to share some of her life for the general public or for the uh, community at large and the world to know 
you know, some of the things that had helped you to be the kind of woman you are, living as long as you have and keeping this, you have always kept the same spirit that I've been knowing. Yeah, I've never seen her down and out, and she's still really alive, you know? And, and how old are you now? I'm 98 years old. 98 years old. Now, this is something is very rare. She's very, God has really blessed her to be here at this age and look at, she's still getting along really well. So I think my, my main point of being here today and the day is uh, uh, September the 10th, uh, 2022. And this is, uh, I mean, I feel blessed to have known her as long as I have and to be a friend and, uh, a, you know, a, a person that, you know, I've been, uh, you know, been able to get a chance to meet her and, and get all, you know, as much wisdom I can from you. So today, you know, in the, we had, like I said, we had three other interviews with her in the past and uh, we shared something about her husband and also some other things. But uh, today, I want to kind of you know, focus more on her childhood, you know, where, you know, where you came up, you know, as far as, you know, your parents, you know, your siblings. And I just want you to feel free to, you know, talk to the public or talk to the community, you know, at large. You just want to share some of your life experience where well, they can maybe, you know, learn from it mm -hmm. and also maybe uh, be blessed like you to live and, and have the same spirit you have of some of, some of those things that you went through, you know, what you, you know, and just try to, uh, you know, and I want you to be free to start as far as you can go back and, and try to share something of your, uh, your childhood that we can move up, okay? So start it's, from, well, let's start where you, where you came. It is my pleasure to be with you, Brother Larry, okay. whom I admire to the utmost. I just admire you so and very much. I admire much. you, my sister. <laughs> and it's a joy okay. to do anything that you ask of me. So actually, my name is Sadie Williams. I was born in Houston, Texas, February the 25th, 1924. And my parents was Logan Carter and Katie Lucas Carter. My parents were, my father was a successful businessman. And I must say right off the top, all of my 98 years, I have been supported on the waterfront, which is international longshore and warehouse. My father, two years before I was born, was the restaurant owner on the waterfront where all longshoremen, regardless to race, creed, or what, had, when I say had, to eat in his restaurant because the waterfront was too far from the city for them to go to any other restaurant for lunch. So my father had money where Longshoreman would sign vouchers, and he had his own money with his name on it, Logan Carter. Like if you would sign a voucher for $20, he would give you $20 of Logan Carter's money. But those vouchers that you signed went up to the payroll and was taken out of the Longshoreman's paycheck before they received their paycheck. Now that's two years before I was born, so we're talking about 1922. And what, what city? Or what Houston, Texas. Houston, Texas. Okay. And the, chip, the uh, waterfront there was called Anderson and Clayton's Ship Channel. It's still there It's because wow. that's where all the ships come into Houston, Texas. And you know shipping. Uh, is where all of our commodities come in. It's import and export. So I was truly blessed. But even before my father and mother, my mother's father was a successful businessman. He made bricks. I mean, when I said made the bricks from straw and whatever else mortar it took to make the bricks, 
in Hempstead, Texas, which is only 50 miles from Houston. He made the bricks for the Hempstead City Hall. He made the bricks for Purview University, it is now in Texas. And so he was a successful businessman making bricks and selling bricks to sell to the various buildings that was in Hempstead and Purview. So that was your, your that was mother's... my grandfather. Yeah, so your mother's father. My mother's father, my so grandfather, yeah. whom I never met. Okay. But my mother and father only had two children, me and my sister, but we played around my grandfather's kill, what was in the ground where he baked those bricks that he made. There was a kill in the ground of my grandmother and grandfather's house where my sister and I played whenever we went to visit my grandmother in the summer in Hempstead, Texas, as I said, which is only 50 miles from Houston. What is a kill? kill. A kill is a kill. where my grandfather baked the oh. bricks that he made. Okay. He made the bricks, then he baked them. Oh, wow. To make them, make them into bricks by baking. Okay. Them. It's and so called, that was his own business, right? That was his, <laughs> and he was the only brick maker wow. in that facility. Okay. So my mother grew up, I would say, middle class okay. in Hempstead, Texas. So and it was you and your uh, your sister, right? That's all. Just the, and my grandmother had no other grandchildren. She had four children. But my mother was the only one that had any children, wow. and my mother only had two, <laughs> two children. Yeah. Okay. So I have no first cousins, okay. not one wow. on my mother's side. Mm -hmm. But I have a lot of first cousins on my father's side, whom I love dearly. And anyway, back to my father's business. My grandfather's business, now my father's business. So owning your own business is really unprofitable, but that is what we do not do as a race today. We do not have businesses of our own, and that is what is missing in our communities. So I would suggest, uh, go to school, learn a trade, open a business, and maintain your business. Now, my, I was, I was full grown, married with two children when my father had his first stroke. So from 1922, oh, I'd say until 19, up to 19, probably 50, my father owned that restaurant in Houston, Texas at Anderson and Clayton Ship Channel. Okay, what was the restaurant called? You remember? Uh, it had no name. Okay, it was okay. just, it was the only place, so it was just open for the longshoremen. It's the only place they could eat. And how old were you then? You remember how old you were? I, was, I wasn't even born. He mm -hmm. opened that restaurant oh. two years before I was born, 1922. 22. When he opened the restaurant, I was born 1924. So, are you were you older than your your sister, or you first? Or I'm I'm younger. I'm two years and ten days younger than my sister, whom I have lost and I miss dearly. Okay. Because we were very, very, very close. Okay. So I'm I'm the only survival in my mother and father's. Well, it was only the two of us. So well, how, how old was your sister when she passed? How long? Oh, my sister was up in age. We oh. were both grown, married, oh, with okay. children. Okay. In so. fact, my children were. And I will say this about my father. Even in the, I'll say the 30s, he was paying cash for his car and my mother's, because they both owned their own car. We were, I guess you could call us middle class blacks. Yeah. Uh, but be, thank God, because they own their own business, that's one of the things I would recommend black people do. Go into business for yourself. But in that case, like my grandfather was the only one making bricks. Mm -hmm. My father was the only one feeding longshoremen. Wow. So, okay. in Houston. Okay. So, okay, now, uh, from your father's, uh, uh, your business, 
Now you said he was in you was in Houston, Texas. So, what was it? When did you do come out here? How, uh, oh, I came here after I graduated from Hughes Business College in Houston. I am a graduate of Hughes Business College in Houston, Texas, and graduated top of my class, mm. but could not get a job because of the color of my skin. Mm -hmm. Because my instructor mm -hmm. would call in advance and tell the companies, I'm sending you my top, one of my top students. Mm -hmm. And the minute they'd see me, mm -hmm. they would say, wow. well, no, we have no job for her. And one of the excuses was that if the people who hired them knew that they were talking to or working with a black woman, they would be, they would lose that company's business because very often the men would invite whomever they're talking to out to lunch or dinner and they would not be want to invite a black woman. Therefore, I was not hired until I moved to California and worked for Golden State Insurance Company, and that was a black-owned insurance company. But I could not get a job in corporate USA. So how how did that make you feel? I mean, how did you deal with that? Actually, Were you depressed or... I did it, actually, you know. it did hurt mm -hmm. because my, my instructors stopped sending me to places because they knew I was depressed after being turned down because of the color of my skin. So they would start telling people in advance because this, the, the business school was also supposed to be able to place their students on jobs as many schools often did during those years. Mm -hmm. So they start telling the company in advance, my top student, but I'll tell you now, she's black. And right away, they would cut her conversation wow. off. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were not considerate of that at all. So, so that was very depressing, and especially when I wanted to do business work in business, because I had graduated from business school. Mm -hmm. But anyway... Was your your parents still alive? Oh yes. Day? Oh God. Yes. So they uh, they motivated. Yeah, I mean, you know, you your your uh, school uh, training when, when you went to school, that was part of uh, your parents helped you to to oh, sure. my, motivate my, you to my want to do that. My sister went to Prairie View College. Prairie View. Yeah. Okay. Where my grandfather had made bricks, so she articulated. Whoa, whoa. Yeah. in the buildings of her grandfather's bricks. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And you went to what? I went, to, I only went to Hughes Business College. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so now after going through that, you know, we, I just want to know, what are the things that you feel that kept you not giving up? You know, because some people get depressed and they they would go off and, you know, just give up. No, well, what, what do you always, think that helped I, you to... I always believed in God. Mm -hmm. So I knew that God had a way for me, mm -hmm. and he would see. So when I graduated and, and came to California, I came to California in 1943. I had married. I married a sailor. Well, he was a sailor when I married him from Hempstead, Texas, whom I had known as a child growing up. and But when he was discharged, honorably discharged from the Navy, I insisted that he became a longshoreman because I know the success longshoremen have always been successful. They are the highest paid common laborers, I'd say, in the United States. That's what now you say you insisted, uh, you, you mean that you encouraged him to Absolutely. do that? Absolutely. <laughs> he had never heard the word longshoreman. And he in, listened to you. In those years, you could actually put someone on the waterfront. Mm -hmm. Because if the job opens now, oh my God, now you can't get on the waterfront at all. Mm. People sleep out, hundreds of people sleep out all night long wow. when they know there's a few openings wow. 
wow. on the waterfront today. Wow. But anyway, yes, I encouraged him, and he became a longshoreman. Well, did, was he? Was he? Did he willingly do that, or did he? Have oh, to? he didn't mind because oh. who wouldn't want to be a longshoreman <laughs> making top pay? Okay. So he happily became a longshoreman, and he was a longshoreman until he died. And when he died, there was a gentleman that spoke at his funeral named Cleophas Williams. And Cleophas Williams was an orator from, oh, he was quite a man. So when he spoke so well at my husband's funeral and my children's father's funeral, uh, when we were leaving to go to the cemetery to bury my first husband, I asked the driver to stop the car because I saw Cleophas standing on the sidewalk talking to some men. And I, I didn't even know his name, mm -hmm. but he and my husband had worked together because they were both longshoremen. Mm -hmm. So when the, the driver stopped the car, he brought me back the name of Cleophas Williams, such and such an address in El Cerrito. So me wanting to thank him for such a magnificent job of speaking, I bought a book of poems called A Light of Many Lamps. And Jackie, my daughter, which I had two children, was at Purview at the time, although as a, you knew I was living in California then. So I sent her the book and asked her to autograph it in memory of her father, but send it back to me so I could see what she said. Mm -hmm. And I, in turn, sent it to Mr. Williams, which meant my return address was on the package. Okay. So what was the so name of that book again? A Light of Many Lamps. And that's I, a, what it was like, had it's poetry? A, it's a book of poetry. Okay. I you have, have still have that book? I, oh, I have that book on my bookshelf <laughs> oh, today. Wow. Okay. But, but I'd say a year or two years later, mm -hmm. Cleophas checked out this widow of mm -hmm. J.D.'s, mm -hmm. whom he had spoken at the funeral, and I'd say a year later, mm -hmm. and then he started dating me. So that's how I ended up marrying. Cleophas Williams and Cleophas and I were married 50 years. So how long were you married to your first husband? I was married to him I'd say a good 12 years. Because 12. So you had two husbands two. both in the wrong shoreman and, and did one they both knew each other. They so worked <laughs> together. I wow. didn't know I didn't know Cleophas so had, but they what? worked together. Mm -hmm. So that's why Cleophas spoke at J.D.'s funeral, okay, because they worked together. Yeah, and as a result, I wanted to thank him mm -hmm. for such a magnificent job. And Cleophas stayed on the waterfront. He became the first black president of Local Ten mm -hmm. in San Francisco, and he was voted president four terms. So he's well, well. In fact, he's a legend on the, on the waterfront. And I know this interview is about me, but I must tell you, Cleophas is in the Smithsonian's in Washington, D.C., wow. in the American History mm -hmm. Museum, in the Labor Department. He's in American History Museum, Smithsonian, mm -hmm. in the Labor section. So anyone that goes to Washington, D.C., Please visit the American History Smithsonian and go to the Labor Department and see Cleophas Williams doing a magnificent job speaking about Longshore, international Longshore and warehousemen. So I don't know how long Larry wants me to <laughs> go well, on. Well, you know, it's interesting now, your relationship with your husband, Cleophas, uh, can you share some of the things that kept you together For as long as you I mean, because I, I know a marriage, you know, what is some of the, uh, uh, I should say, the recipes 
that you would suggest to other people I would that kept you guys as long as you were together and, and I guess a happy relationship? I you know? would suggest respect one another. You must remember, you did not raise your son, or your, I mean, I'm sorry, you did not raise your husband, mm -hmm. and he did not raise you. Mm -hmm. And you both came from different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Because believe me, Cleophas saw depression. I don't know anything about the depression at all. I couldn't tell you the dates because my parents didn't suffer. I'm sure there were not as many ships coming into Anderson Clayton. But my daddy's restaurant never closed because Long Shorts was still working. But Cleophas suffered. He came from Arkansas. And it hurts me even today to talk about some of the things that Cleophas went through during the Depression, because mm -hmm. I never knew nothing about it. But think what a magnificent man. Mm -hmm. He became the first black president mm -hmm. of a big local union, Local 10, ILW Local 10, San Francisco at Fisherman's Wharf. Mm -hmm. If you don't know where the longshoremen's it takes up the whole block, one block from Fishman's Wharf. It's on North Point Street, mm -hmm. 400 North Point Street, San Francisco. And he became the first black president and was elected four times. So wow. as I said, he is a legend. Okay, so on now. The waterfront. But uh, we were married because we respected one another. I respected him and he respected me. I also have to thank Larry. One of the reasons also our marriage lasts that I was brought up on the waterfront. Okay. So I kind of think that gave me knowledge because after all, I, all of my life until I married and left Houston, I worked in my father's restaurant when I got old enough to do that. And so I knew about longshoremen. Mm -hmm. I knew, I knew the fact when I was a baby, I think my daddy and mother took me into his restaurant and placed me on the counter of his restaurant. So, yeah, I grew up, as I said, all of my 98 years, I have been supported by the waterfront. Mm -hmm. Not one day have I been my daddy, my first husband, and Cleophas. Wow. So now Cleophas, with his rich history, and I mean the way he is, did he have similar parents? Do you know how his oh, parents he, were? The were they I, productive like your parents were? Oh, I can tell you, Larry, it breaks my heart today to hear what they went through during Depression. They, no, they have not similar to my parents at all. Oh, okay. Because like I said, my father was paying cash for automobiles in mm -hmm. the 20s. Mm -hmm. So and his, his parents, he had a different situation. His he grew parents up mm -hmm. were making maybe thirty-five dollars a month, mm -hmm. and, and his father was a school teacher and a principal. But, but in Arkansas, oh my God, did he suffer! And so then, he came out of a yeah, whole lot up. of stuff to oh, get where he's at. I mean, he, he so like his parents. so so hard. Mm -hmm. His parents did a magnificent job because he was highly educated as his father was a school teacher, oh. making $35 a month in a one-room school, wow. Oh, wow. as Cleo would tell me about. But Good. such a dip. Our lives were extreme opposites. I mean, extreme. Because as I say, I know nothing about the depression. Mm. And he suffered, suffered. His whole family suffered during the depression. No. But anyway, we respect, I tell you, the greatest thing on earth is love. Love is the answer to anything. But respect one another. And remember, you came from different backgrounds, so you cannot change your husband, and he cannot change you as a wife. But respect one another for whatever it is, because we all represent our backgrounds. I mean, as the barks don't fall too far from the tree. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, but really, respect is 
truly what you have to give. The minute you say, I do, you have to want to respect that person. Now, you most certainly let that person know things that you don't like that he or she did. Cleophas used to have a habit of raising his voice to me sometimes when he was angry, and it would make me just shake because my parents did not raise their voices yeah. at my sister and me. Mm -hmm. And I would say, Cleophas, please don't raise your voice at me. And it took him a long time. As a matter of fact, I left him mm -hmm. because of him screaming and scaring me half to death when he's angry. Because when he screamed, I think, surely you're going to kill me or <laughs> hit me or whatever. And I would shake. So I left him. And if you want to know the truth, that is when I became a Muslim. Mm -hmm. My mother lived across the street from the temple, mm -hmm. and I packed all of my clothes and a full view mirror on wheels because I always like to look good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Still I've look always good. Still look good. My mother was a fashion plate, so oh, wow. fashions was a part of me. But anyway, when Cleophas screamed at me for the last you didn't time, that. You didn't. I couldn't handle it. So I left. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget. And I was going to go to my mother's house across from the mosque. And when I said, instead of going to my mother, why don't I go over here and see what these Muslims will do towards seeing a woman who is leaving her husband? Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget the day I wished I could tell you what brother was at the head of the stairs on Geary Street, if you knew mm -hmm. where the mosque was. Mm -hmm. And when I opened that door, I'll never forget, I can hear him clearly, yes. <laughs> yeah. He's up at the top of the stairs. Yeah, yeah. And I'm downstairs saying, I have no place to live. Mm -hmm. And he said, stay right there. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget, he went and got a sister named Sister Ida Bell. Mm. And she came down where I was and took me upstairs. And of course, then I was frisked or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And she took me home with her that evening where she had two children. Uh, her girl was the oldest and her son was the youngest. And he must have been about eight or nine years old, but he was the man of the house. That little brother, that evening, I'll never forget it, prayed, he, they prayed. You know more about the Muslims of most of you than I do. But that next day, I went to the mosque with Sister Ida Bell and her two children and fell in love what I heard the minister saying and I think about the third day I joined the mosque now mind you I've left Cleophas mm -hmm. Cleophas and I knew nothing about Muslims mm -hmm. and when I joined the mosque wasn't long before I was elected captain I became sister captain Sadie right. and I taught those beautiful sisters because my mother taught me well how to be a homemaker. I taught them how to fold the contoured sheets, how to fold towels, how to fold their clothes, because I brought things from my house and taught those sisters. Oh, I, I tell you, right today, some of the brothers will thank me for what I taught those Ooh. sisters. Wow. So I, I, today I'm respected in the Islamic world. And that I appreciate, and it's because I taught them how to set tables. I taught them anything that I thought I could teach those sisters. That's what I did. And I also opened a school store at the mosque mm -hmm. where I bought tablets, pencils, and notebook paper and sold it right there. Because what I know about business is all of my life, my grandfather and my father. And I graduated from business school. So I opened up a little school store in the mosque. Mm -hmm. And after from that store, then I opened up a consignment shop across the street on Geary Street. Mm -hmm. So I 
brought business into the mosque mm -hmm. as Captain Sadie. But today I'm grateful. So one day I had left the mosque because I own my own property mm -hmm. out in Brookfield Village. Even when I married Cleophas, I wanted to put his name on my deeds. And he said, oh no, you and your two children had that property. When you married me, it belonged to the two of, to the three of you. So he wouldn't even let me put his name on the deeds. So, but my daughter and her two children were living in my property at the time. And even though I had left Cleophas, he knew that I was gonna come and see my daughter and grandchildren. So one day as I was coming down Bernhardt Drive, which Malta Court is the street my house was on, ran into. Cleophas was parked out there waiting for me. And when I when he saw my car, he jumped out of his car and came over to the driver's side and and put his head in the window crying, <laughs> saying, I'm not prepared to live without you. I'm not prepared to live without you. I want you to come home, come home. And I said to him, I will not come home unless you go and let the Imam talk to you. Because mm. neither of us knew anything about Muslims before I left Cleof. <laughs> So he agreed, because he, that time, wanted me back. He would have agreed to anything, oh, wow. I do believe. <laughs> well. So he came to the mosque. Mm -hmm. I wish I remember which imam was there then. Mm -hmm. And he talked to him, and I understand the imam told him, this would clear off the top. Now, she's your wife, but she's our sister and don't you put your hands <laughs> on her. Now you brothers can tell more about what yeah. you were taught about how to treat. But evidently Cleophas said that's what the Imam told him. And I want you to know, Cleophas never raised his voice at me. <laughs> <laughs> so then we lived ha happily ever after for 50 years. I don't wow. remember what, how many years we were married when that happened, but early, early in our marriage. Wow. You know, you know, it's a very interesting because, you know, you had a strong will because, you know, for you to leave, you know, after you raised the boy, and you left with nothing, right? Because he, he was kind of taking care of you, right? Not, was he, let me tell you. <laughs> oh my God, I'll tell you, women, if you can marry a longshoreman, you will be blessed and taken care of the rest of your <laughs> life which I am being taken care of today because of Cleophas. Not kind of taking care of me, he was taking very good care of me. Mm -hmm. But I was, yep, yeah, strong will, didn't make me any difference. You were Although, mm -hmm. I am always interested in being cared for because I'd been cared for all my life. But I gave no thought to that. I could not stand being shocked mm -hmm. and nerved up with somebody raising or screaming at me so yes I left mm -hmm. well you know that, that's a good lesson because you stood up and even though you left with nothing then look you you came up without you know starting with I a had only my nothing. clothes <laughs> and a full length mirror and you ended up <laughs> having business to, wow that's great that's great history you know to share but you know what? I'm really glad he came and got me because no telling where I would have ended up. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I don't know where I would yeah, have yeah. ended up. Yeah. So that was a chance to take to leave him. Yeah. But I sure am glad he yeah. knew he couldn't live without me. That's good. That's but I will tell ladies, uh, I will say, you know, when I said my vows, I did not say what, what's the word you say about uh, being whatever your husband? Always stand up for yourself, but treat your husband with love and kindness. When Cliff would get off from work, a many day, I would have a foot pan at his chair so I wouldn't forget to soak his feet, mm. cut his fingernails, wow. his toenails. 
massage his feet. Wow. Take care of your, take care of your mm. man, cause you, a, for a woman should, mm. you know, I enjoyed being a woman. Mm. I enjoyed being feminine, and I enjoyed, I say, even making my husband feel good. <laughs> mm. Mm -hmm. But that is being a real woman. Mm -hmm. I would put this foot pan by Cleopatra's lounge chair so when I got through giving him dinner, I would soak his feet and I'm not ashamed. I would soak my husband's feet, but I don't want one if I had one today. <laughs> wow, wow. I mean, that's, that's a good lesson. Didn't Jesus wash, wash feet? <laughs> Who are we that we could not wash our husband's feet, massage his back, and love him? Take care of him. Make him feel like no other woman can make him feel. I used to say that about my husband. He, if he played with another woman, she could not treat him better than I could treat him. That is for sure. Mm -hmm. I made sure of that. That's I cool. mean, he belong. He belonged to me. Mm -hmm. If I've said I do, he belongs to me, and I belong to him. Mm -hmm. Therefore, he take good care of me. And therefore, I take good care of him. Mm -hmm. That's I think. Think women sometimes. Oh my God, yeah. they don't want to cook. You, yeah, that's why he wanted you back so bad. <laughs> you, you want to get that back again? Yeah, no. Wow, that's interesting. So, uh, you know, and I, you know, I, I just admire you for you know the strength that you have and, and the spirit that you have. You know, all these years. Now, uh, I know also. You know, you had, uh, you've been busy, you've been, you, your life, you know, even though you've been married to a, a successful husband, you also kept yourself busy too, I right? was always involved in my community, mm -hmm. and of course when I was raising my two children, not Cleophas' children, mm -hmm. I kept them involved. They went to dancing school, they went, my daughter went to charm classes, my son played Drums. I, I really enjoy this interview with you. Again, this is the fourth one. This is not going to be the last one. So, now you you are also planning something uh, for your birthday, right? <laughs> you want to share that? I want. I really want to share that one. You want to share that? Okay. So just share, you know, something about what you're planning uh, for your. Are you? Are you on? Yeah, it's on. Uh. February the 25th, 2024, I will be 100 years old. Wow. <laughs> and I already have the Longshoreman's Hiring Hall, which holds thousands of people for my birthday. And my birthday will be from 11 to 2 at 400 North Point, San Francisco. That is the long swimmer. And I am honored that they are allowing me that vendor wow. for my 100th birthday. Wow. So you already got this set up? You got oh, the date? Coming, it is so settled. <laughs> okay, wow. So they are planning on me, but for Miss Sadie, the hall is. So that'll be your 100th birthday. And what date is that going to be again? February 25, February 25th. 2024. 2024. So that's like two years. Yeah, I'm 98 now. Yeah. Then next year I'll be 99. Uh -huh. And then 2024 okay, so I'll be 100 years old. Wow, that's great. And I'm so excited. And so, you know, I really want I've to... got my music. I've got three. I have a band three-piece band. Wow. I have a disc jockey and Ooh. then I have what they call harps in the hood. That's a late, beautiful lady that plays the harp mm -hmm. and she's called harps in the hood that will be playing for me. And I have my photographer. I have my caterers. In fact, I have my party all ready only thing I gotta do is be here February 25, <laughs> yeah, okay. 2024. Uh -huh. And I invite anybody that wants to share my 100th birthday with me that know me. I don't want people coming yeah. that don't know me. 
for everybody that, as I say, the hall holds more than a thousand people. Wow. So, because What's that hall rents to big concerts and big bands. But I have it for my 100th birthday. Well, you know that's that's also something unique. Where about you now? Here you planning something that you know two years ahead of time. Well, now yeah. is this something new that no. you have? You always been a, like a planner way ahead of time. You, yes, sir. So I do not believe it. in waiting till last minute uh -huh. to do anything. As a matter of fact, next Saturday, a week from today. I will be going to Long Beach to the Longshoremen's Pensioners. Now that's us old oh, you folks. Around. <laughs> that Ooh, the Pensioners you Convention. Uh -huh. That's one week from today. Wow. And I have already planned all of my friends, relatives that live in Southern California. What? I have sent them all. Wow. I'm leaving two days before the convention so that now okay yeah so we as I, I mentioned earlier uh, you had a lot of trips you and your husband to other countries right to so we want to share continent. some of that with we us we went to every continent of course there's only seven mm -hmm. including the Antarctic but we went to every continent and many countries watch your phone with watch your phone it's, going yeah, it's not oh. gonna fall I'm okay go ahead and and uh, many countries within the continents, uh, you name it. So you said you went to Africa? Oh, we went to Africa five times. And we went to Kenya as our first trip to Africa. And if you can tell from the way I can run my mouth, I would tell people if you ever come to the United States, be sure you look us up and come see Cleofton Sadie. Cliffs and I came home from Kenya, was home two weeks, and an African family sent their daughter to us. And she got her master's degree. She worked the heck out of me getting her enrolled in school. Africans are the most intelligent people on the planet, mm. and they believe in education. Their kids don't fool around in school like our kids fool around. I get disgusted sometimes with the American education. They just don't have the facilities that we have. And it's purposely done. I mean, people make sure, but, but back to what they show us in America is either safaris or the slums, but African is a modern country. Mm. The Africans make and do every, when I say everything, everything, the many things the American people have never been able to do here, they do there because they do everything. They have airplane pilots. I mean, the African airline is flown by black mm. African men. Wow. All the students, it's, it's, it's unbelievable to visit. I've had some blacks tell me they'd rather visit Europe than Africa. They're crazy because they've been brainwashed. It would pay to visit. I wish I could just take every black American to visit Africa. It would change their whole attitude about themselves and from whence we came. But they do have some of the rural areas, right? Oh, they, some, some don't we have slums and yeah, things here? Yeah, it's the same thing. They have horrible slums. Mm -hmm. I mean, but that's what the American shows you. you yeah, so. They don't show the upper class. I would love for you to see some of Africa in my picture books because my husband kept journals of everywhere we traveled. Mm -hmm. I have written journals by Cleophas. Mm -hmm of every place, Australia, Singapore, you name it, he wrote journals and I took pictures. So I have I have cabinet full of picture books of all the places we travel. I love sharing my books and love sharing his writings. But it's a legacy that we leave to our beautiful children. 
So you, you lived a full life. I you? don't mind. I have five generations. Five wow. generations. I'm wearing a bracelet, if you can see it, yeah. on my arm. With all of my, there's 22 of us. Wow. With them. All, each have their own little silhouette with their name and birth date on it. Wow. And the other bracelet is world travel. Wow. I never take my bracelets <laughs> off. I wear yeah. this. But anyway, oh yeah, we've had a beautiful, full, full, full life. But let me tell you, Africa is some place that you need to go. I would like to show you some pictures of how modern Africa is. And if you can ask me, how many pictures do the Americans show you of the modern Africa? I remember people asking me, oh, are you going on a safari? I said, let me tell you, if I wanted to see animals, I'd go to the zoo. <laughs> I don't have to go to Africa because yeah. I went on one safari. I went on, that's enough for me. I go to meet the people which I met. I go to see the progress, the culture, and all. So I have a lot of history about Africa. I even had children ask me, did they have any cars? They drive Mercedes mm. because Mercedes are made close to them in England. They, trucks, every every kind of car you can think of, they have in Mercedes. This is in Africa. This is, man, oh, I wish you could see how yeah. well some Africans live. Sure, they have slums. Look how well some black Americans live, and yet we have slums. Right. No, we don't have slums. We have ridiculous homeless people. Mm -hmm. I mean, everywhere you look, you find homeless camps uncalled for in America. Mm -hmm. Uncalled for America to show you only the slums of Africa. Mm -hmm. That's what they want you to think Africans are. You are missing mm -hmm. your pride and your joy. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> That's an arrest. Wow. Five times. Let me see if I can name Kenya. Uh, Cause I went. I actually. Have you been went, to China? I, I, oh yeah, I've been. Oh, every continent. Wow. Yeah, China, Hong Kong. Wow. I have them all here on my bracelet. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, we went to Egypt first. Wow. Man. I'm not in love with Egypt except for the pyramids. Okay. Because when I went to Egypt's museum. They showed statues of asbestos white people mm. and they chopped the nose off of the black so they won't look up. Oh, Egypt is very prejudiced. Mm. Egypt don't want to wow. be black wow. in many cases. Mm -hmm. I went to Egypt, Kenya, uh, Ghana, mm -hmm. South Africa, mm -hmm. Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. if if I used to ask Cliff, honey, put some money in Zimbabwe so I can go back and forth to Zimbabwe. You like I Zimbabwe. love Zimbabwe for not for the, the You been to Senegal? Huh? Senegal? I've never been to Senegal. Oh, yeah, There's a lot of places in Africa I have not been that I would love to go. Of course I'm not traveling anymore. Not abroad. Right. I do travel, but like last May I went to Washington DC. Uh, and uh, like Saturday, I'll be going to Long Beach. I travel, but uh, 98 is too difficult for oh, me to travel. And then, of course, some members of my family always have to go with you. <laughs> wow. Sadie, let's wrap it up so, so we can uh, let you go and, uh, you know, we'll we, we continue. Get ready for my dinner. <laughs> yeah. So I really appreciate you, my sister. Love you. I and love you, Larry. You're, you're, you're Larry, a great, I a love great you. blessing. And a great blessing to God hear and to keep you, you know, the, you know, you're just so unique. You know, I just wanted to make sure that hopefully, you know, that the community and the world to see what kind of person, you know, because, you know, they need to see examples. Like you said, you know, just like they don't show us some things in Africa. That's right. They don't show you people like yourself. And, you know, share with our our young people That's right. because they they they, they 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 give these other idols, you know, on the media 
like a you know a, a strong uh, uh, device that they're kind of manipulating and keep our young people you know in the condition they are so that they, they don't, don't know show, who they are they don't show the they positive they don't know things. who they are from they, whence they came that's right and it's too bad and they don't show the positive thing because no. you have a lot of positive things going on in our community and that's what I try to do in my, uh, my videos is try to show the positive things that's happening in Oakland and in, in, in our community. Absolutely. It's not all the negative. Yeah, we know, just like you said, it's negative things going Everywhere. on. Everywhere. Yes. But it always will be some, but we need to know the positive, positive things. things. yeah. So, Sadie, once again, once again, I love you, I love Larry. you. <laughs> and I appreciate you giving me your time, and, and, you know, and your, your patience. So, once again, this is a, a great blessing for me to see you again and to, for you to share your history. And I learned a little more this time. So each time we get a little more. Okay. <laughs> we can't cover all of can't it. You know? it Try to cover long. as much as we can, right? No. <laughs> all right. All right, brother. I've lived too long. Mm -hmm. I love right. you, Larry. All right. Okay, that's it. All right, we wrap it up. I remember sitting 